series on leadership, and today is our last one. It's been the seven sailing, the seven seas of leadership, and uh, we've been on working on community for the past two Sundays. Oh, by the way, thank you everyone who really helped us with community last Sunday afternoon with a picnic. Thank you everyone who cooked, who prepared food, set up, uh, tear down, and everything else. That was awesome. But how important it is that when we talk about being a people of influence, that we're not talking about people doing it in isolation. We need to be in connection, in community. And I said first with Christ and with, with each other. And then today I want to talk about how we actually are also need to be in community with those we lead. So to just illustrate that point, um, I, I need to pretend, ask you to pretend that you don't know me. I'm a complete stranger to you. And some of you will say, oh, that's no problem. Okay. But uh, the rest of you just pretend that I'm a complete stranger to you. All right. And I would say, let me just pick someone out of the crowd here, uh, some willing victim, and just say, Michael. Okay. I know your name. You don't know me. Okay. Okay. We all say, follow me. Follow me. Come on, follow me. No. Oh, why? Uh, what's going through your head right now? You're a stranger. Who are you? Why are you asking me to follow you, right? And where in the world are you taking me, perhaps, even? Right? Okay. If I said, oh, hey, I've got a big pot of gold right behind these banners here. Just follow me to it, okay? Yeah, you would be filthy rich. Might be a little skeptical, right? Okay. Maybe I have a better goal. We're all more spiritual minded here, okay? So I was like, follow me and I'll lead you to Christ. How's that sound? Better, okay. But who's Christ? Some of them may say, okay. Um, why? Okay, and, and some of us who. You know, a little aware of stuff in, in the spiritual, religious realm, going like, okay, are you a cult? Yeah. You know, are you a sect leader? Uh, are you going to take me to some weird religion? Right? Okay. Because I'm a stranger, remember? You don't know me. See, when we, when we don't know someone, and you, you don't have this thing called trust. You don't have this thing called, like, confidence in this person and if not only the goal is important but who that person leading you to that goal is very important right especially if the road to that um, goal is difficult so let's say Ron okay I can lead you to Christ but this is what you got to do you have to follow me exactly as I do and the way to follow Christ is to walk like a chicken Okay, so you gotta follow me like this, okay? Come on, Ron, you can do this, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. No, okay. Right. So, all this is talking about community. All this is talking about that leadership is ultimately uh, interpersonal, it is ultimately relational. You can't lead through just texting, you can't lead through a message or an email, um, even though social media is great in being. Broadening your influence, deepening your influence comes by people knowing you, you knowing them, and ultimately, as we see, by Christ's own example of leadership. And that's where we're going to go to today. Let me lead us in prayer right now. Father, we pray as we come into your word this morning, and we talk about your word, Lord, may it not just simply be talking about your word, but that you will be talking to us in your word, through your word, through the power of your spirit. And help us all, as you've called us to be your children, you've also called us uh, to be, have this wonderful privilege of being the light of the world, to be the salt of the world. And Lord, continue to equip us each day to be like that, and especially today as we look into how Jesus led others. Turn with me to, in your Bibles, to John chapter 10, verse 11 through 15. And um, by the way, someone's been 
encouraged me to do this, and I like that idea, so let's do this. Let's read this together, okay, out loud, okay? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Oh, I'm, so, I'm doing this. I'm sorry. I'm doing this. <laughs> okay, let's cue then. Okay. Um, then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You know what a shepherd is? Oh, you might say, well, you know, the guy who has that crooked stick and takes care of sheep. But you know what a shepherd also is? A shepherd also is a leader, right? He's a leader of animals, sheep, but most likely, if he's got a decent enough sized flock, he's also a leader of people because he's got need helpers, his hired workers who will help him manage the work of this flock. So a shepherd is a leader, and Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd, also saying, I am the good leader. So then, what makes a good leader? Well, Jesus brings out some important qualities here, uh, in, but there is one that is absolutely essential. Verse 12 and 13 says that the good shepherd isn't going to be like the hired hands who run away at the first sign of danger. He's going to be there to defend his sheep. So one of the qualities is that he's a defender of his sheep. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our good shepherd because he's also our shield and our defender, right? He is our rock. He is our fortress. So he is, um, he is that good shepherd. Jesus also points out in verse 14 that he says the good shepherd knows his sheep. If you look back earlier in the verse, in the chapter, in verse 3, uh, he says that the shepherd calls his sheep by name. Now, let me ask you. I'll show you this picture of some sheep here. And if I told you one of them was named Larry, and then I mixed them up a little bit, could you tell who Larry is? No. How about if one of these was called Larry and Mo and Curly? Okay. And I threw them into the mix here and put them in a bigger flock. Or even put them in a, this flock. Could you tell? No, I couldn't. I look at this like, these look like clones. They all look alike. But Jesus says that the shepherd calls his shape by, by name and that the good shepherd knows his sheep. Jesus is our good shepherd because he doesn't lose any of us in the crowd. You know? He doesn't forget any of us and say, well, he doesn't want the masses. He knows us individually. But the most important thing, oh, if I said, well, let's skip one more thing. Um, let me pause that for a moment and say, he also says his sheep know him. His sheep know him. So let's try playing that video here and, uh, and see what that means.
Is that cool? Is that cool? Well, how did that happen? How did the sheep respond to the owner's voice and only to the owner's voice? It's because, well, it didn't happen overnight, right? In him fully. The cross is our constant reminder that we can trust him fully. There's no hidden agenda. There's no market value he's looking for through our salvation. And that means there's nothing, whether it's talking about your money, your relationships, your career, your time, whatever you think is a sacrifice because if you obey him, you lose something and therefore we distrust him. We need to wipe that out of our minds and say, there's only one reason he wants us to obey him. We, there's only one reason that he wants us to follow his commandments is because he loves us. And he knows that by following those commandments, we will be the most blessed. We will be the most rewarded of people. But I think our minds, maybe not our minds, our spirit, our fallen nature, we're always worry, working with distrust, right? We're always wondering, is that really true? And maybe your circumstances make you feel that way. You say, well, I'm trusting Jesus. But I'm still getting conflicts. I'm still getting stressed out. I'm still having pressures. I'm still having fears and worries. And people don't like me. I still feel lonely or I feel depressed. And we can go on and on and say, well, if Jesus is this good shepherd, what point is it that, where is he protecting me? You know, why should I be trusting him if I'm still going through all of this, what, make, what difference does it make? Well, let me ask you. Lord forbid, but one day you got seriously ill or badly injured, and the medical professionals, the doctors examining you said, you need surgery to fix this. Would you probably consent to that surgery? Yeah. Most of us would, okay? But did you know that when you're in surgery, they do horrible things to you? They do horrible things to you. Let me start with the anesthesiologist, okay? They're going to put you with drugs in your body that is going to stop you from breathing on your own. It is going to slow your heart rate, you know, reduce your blood pressure, and just immobilize every muscle practically in your body. Now your bowels are going to move. Okay, some medical professional just told me that basically general anesthesiology and anesthetics, the purpose of it, the goal is to make you close to death without killing you. Ooh, isn't that exciting? And that's before the surgeon even gets to you. The surgeon is going to take that scalpel and he's going to cut you. And he's going to cut through your skin and then your fat and then your muscles and then down deep inside of you. And he knows, depending on the surgery, he might, surgery, he just might take organs out of you, you know, parts of your body, cut them out. He's, they're going to clamp off blood vessels. And this, and this new technology, was not that new anymore, is to stop the bleeding. You know, they, they use um, lasers or electricity to cauterize, meaning to stop the bleeding. Basically, they burn your flesh so you won't bleed. So the operating room has the smell of your burning flesh. Is that great? And then, depending again on the surgery, like orthopedic surgery like I had, they may start bringing out the power drill, you know, your Black & Decker power drill, your little power saw, and drill through your bone and cut off parts of your bone. They're trying to replace a joint. They just you know, cut off that joint from your bone. And then I've seen videos where, you know, there's, there's doctors, they're using like hammers, boom, 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 smacking those new joints into the bone there. You know, Carlton knows she's, she's nodding her head, so I'm not telling you some fanciful stuff, right? It's real. And if they're going to uh, do some open heart surgery, they got to cut through your rib cage. They take these things that spread your rib cage open, and then they stop your heart. Okay? And they have to do whatever they do, 
And after they did all this wonderful, horrendous stuff to your body, they take a needle and they start piercing your body over and over again and stitch you up. Or they take staples. Gung, 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 gung. Okay? Or super glue, I hear it now. Okay? You just super glue your you know, stuff together, back together. And meanwhile, oh, they might have put some implants into there, all kinds of stuff. And then after you're all, they're all done with you there, you get to go through recovery. Oh, which could take a few days to a few months. In the first few days, you might be in excruciating pain. You may feel nauseous, and you're weak, and you're bedridden, perhaps. And then you have to go through physical therapy, perhaps. And stretch you, and make you walk when you don't want to walk, and, and you're teetering time. At first, you thought you were completely normal. After surgery, you're a wreck. Okay? And then you're going to do that for days and weeks, and you still want to consent to surgery? Now it's only going, no, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. Okay, no, but you still would, wouldn't you? Right? Why? Why would you still consent to that, knowing now all that you would go through? Because, A, you believe that that surgery is going to heal uh, your illness or fix a broken bone or something. And secondly, because you trust those doctors. You trust that anesthesiologist. You trust that surgeon. You trust those nurses. You trust the physical therapist. You trust all those people that's in this process. So you're willing to go through all this horrendous stuff to your body, right? Let me change the metaphor here of the good, doc good shepherd to Jesus, the good doctor. Jesus is the good doctor, the good anesthesiologist, the good surgeon, the good nurse, the good physical therapist. And all those painful things that we complain about, the stress, the pressure, the loneliness, the rejection, all those other things are like that scalpel cut. It's like that cutting through a bone, pinching off a blood vessel, like stitching a suture. Yes, they're painful. Yes, they even will leave a scar. And yes, it may take days, weeks, even months to recover. And yes, you may not be the same as you were before. But our good doctor, our good surgeon, our good anesthesiologist is using all those things to heal us to remove an infection, to remove a cancer, to realign something in our lives that was broken, to put an implant in us that will keep us healthier and alive longer and ultimately for all eternity. See, we can trust the Lord because he's the good shepherd. And he lays down his life for us. And all those other things that we think are evidence that he's not that good is ultimately tools that he's using to strengthen, build us up, and equip us for the future. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 35 to 39 this. Let's, uh, let's read this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is your confidence. That is my confidence. That is our confidence. And when we talk about nothing separates from the love of Christ, it's not just a sentimental love. It is the powerful, almighty, gracious love of Christ. 
has come to save us, come to continue to heal us, come to ultimately to bless us. That's why you can trust him. That's why you can trust Christ. Here in that last video, is really endearing. You see all the sheep coming to the shepherd, and there's just this innocence. There's just this innocence um, and eagerness to just be with the shepherd. They trusted the shepherd. And we need to be like those sheep, trusting him every moment and just enjoying being in his presence. What I'm going to do here is invite you right now um, to come to Christ's presence in communion, to just confess again, as Chris led us, that we are fully committed to him, that we have decided to follow Jesus, and there's no turning back. But it's okay. It's not just okay. It's awesome. It is great. I invite you also there in this time, as you come here, that maybe you came here with doubts. Maybe you came here questioning what God is doing in your life and starting to doubt his love, his will, his power in your life. Take this time right now to come back to the shepherd and say, I trust you. I know you are able I know you're able to do exceedingly above and beyond anything that I can imagine. Chris, could you lead us in that uh, next song and how we do it in in GC2 is we just invite anyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, has a relationship with him, to come to one of these tables, which are two here and one in the back, and take piece of bread and take a cup and remember that the bread represents the body of Christ which is broken for us and the cup which represents the blood of Christ and both together represent this good shepherd who laid down his life for us for no other reason except because he loves you me and all sinners and we can trust him and take this cup in celebration, but also in faith. And say, I trust you, Lord. I trust your love. Thank you for dying on the cross.
Indeed, our God is able. He has saved us, saved us from our sins, saved us from hell. But he's also given us the privilege, a calling, not because he needs us to do this, but because he knows that if we do this, we'll be even more blessed. And that calling is to become like him. And that's one of the reasons we have um, belong, become, believe. That a one of the important goals of becoming, of believing in Christ, is to become like Him. And that includes shepherding others. Let's read this together, okay? Um, and let's read it together. Not this mumbled, okay? <laughs> let's really read this together, okay? To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the solemn pledge or charge, uh, the apostle Peter gives to the elders, the leaders of the church that he's writing to, he charges them to be good leaders. But he doesn't say, be great CEOs, managers. He doesn't say, even from the family analogy, be great fathers or brothers or sisters of the church. He says, be shepherds. Be shepherds of the flock, just like Jesus, who is the chief shepherd. We come to Jesus to become like Jesus. So I want to leave you with an exhortation, a challenge as well. As we have received the love of Christ, we have the opportunity to reflect that love to everyone around us. And as we have enjoyed being shepherded by the Good Shepherd, we also have the opportunity to shepherd others. And though this passage is about church leaders shepherding a church, it really can apply to every one of us, whether we're young or old, because all of us have given, been given a flock to take care of. Some of us are parents. And there is your flock, your children. Some of us are in areas of management and leadership in work. And that is your flock. Some of you are teachers, whether here at GC2 or somewhere outside of GC2. Your students is your flock. And even if you're in junior high, you have a flock. You have siblings, brothers and sisters in your family. You have friends. You have classmates. You have people that God has placed in your circle of influence and God is calling you to also shepherd them. Shepherd them. And what does that mean? Well, right straight from what we just learned from the Good Shepherd, the most important question you ask yourself, I ask of you is, do you love these people that God has placed under your care? Do you love them as unconditionally as Christ loves us? Or do you love them with some kind of agenda? Like, if I do this for them, I expect them to be nice to me. Or come, give me something in return. How unconditional is your love? 
how you might say, oh, I have no problem with my kids, my family. Sure, I do that. But let's remove that a little bit further. How about those who are in your workplace? How about those rambunctious kids in your class that don't listen to you? Um, or back down to your junior hires. How about your siblings, your sisters, your brothers, your friends? Are you your, their friend because you're hoping they will be your friend in return and they'll be nice to you too? Or is it an unconditional love? A love that does not expect something in return. And if you love them, and you say you do, then also be like Jesus and know them. Know them. You know how you know someone? How does a shepherd know the sheep? He spends lots of time with them. I mean, we can't tell the distinguish between one sheep from another because they all look the same, right? But if a shepherd spends enough time with each one of the sheep, he goes, oh, this one's got a little longer ears, or this one's a little shorter, and this one's eyes are a little closer than the other eyes, and this one's a little yellow instead of white and gray, and he, they start picking up the nuances, right? Okay, I know which one's Larry, Curly, and Mo. okay? And you and I, we love someone. We also need to spend that time with them and to get to know them, their nuances, their personality, their strengths, their weaknesses, even in the workplace. Because by doing that, you also know how they best fit in the organization. But thirdly, and last challenge is, reward and bless those under your care. You know, the last verse here, verse 4, says, talking about the elders, he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, when Christ returns, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. The good shepherd rewards. The good shepherd blesses those he loves. And he, here, he's saying, you know, you will be blessed by, him, by Christ himself with his this crown of glory. You don't know what it is, but I'm, going to be, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. So reward and bless those under your care. You say, wow, does that work in the office? You know, it sure does. I was reading up last year about Aetna. You may have all heard of it. It's a big insurance company, right? Well, in 2015, they raised their minimum wage to $16 per hour across the board. The whole, this massive corporation. And then, on top of that, they started paying their employees. This, you say, could ask your company to do this. They started paying their employees up to $500 a year if they can report that they had 20 days straight of sleep of seven hours or more. Basically, they would pay you 25 dollars each time you had a good night's sleep of seven hours or more. And they, you know, they use your Fitbit, whatever, you know, device that you know, report that. And they go, okay, we'll give you up to $500 to uh, have a good night's sleep. And this year, 2016, they started paying off employee student loans up to $10,000 of loan over a five-year period. You know, you think that had an effect on their employees? Oh, yeah. And one of the webs, um, you know, rating, you have these websites that say, hey, rate your employer, rate the company you work in. And that gets four out of five. And consistently they have comments from their employees. A great place to work. They help me grow. And when you ask, oh, you know, how does that affect your bottom line? Well, Aetna stocks have nearly tripled in value over the years that this new CEO not that new anymore, came on board and started implementing these changes. I, the reason I, was, I came across it last year, I read about this and said, this is a company that I want to invest in. So I bought shares in that last year. In a around 18 months, my share has gone up around 23%. Pretty good, huh? See, I don't know if CEO knew anything about Jesus' principles of good shepherding or the Bible, but he was following it. You know, God has wisdom in his word. So, where is your heart 
Do you really love those that are under your care? Because Christ has called you to shepherd them. You have an opportunity to bless them, to love them. Whether we're talking about the family, or the boardroom, or the classroom, or just hanging out with friends. He said, I love them. Of course I love them. Then work at it. Love them by knowing them. Love them by letting them know you. And love them by blessing and rewarding them. Something, by the way, maybe some of us who are Asian may need to work at. Because, you know, our culture is horrible at rewarding, you know? It's always like, it's not good enough. You know, get an A minus, oh, it needs to be an A. You know, um, my daughter, Jessica, she's been enjoying this ABC series, uh, comedy series, Fresh Off the Boat. How many of you watch this? Okay, so go. Now, she goes, Dad, did you watch Fresh Off the Boat? I said, you know, I, I watched a couple episodes. I, I don't think it's so funny. And she goes, oh, it's hilarious. And uh, she goes like, I asked her, so, so why? Why do you think it's so funny? He goes, it's so real. <laughs> I was like, well, what she thinks about family. Where did she get that idea from? Uh, anyways, you know, it, it's a storyline basically is about Asian family. And you know, one of the main characters is the mother, who is you know, this typical high pressure, pushy tiger mom, you know, stereotype of uh, Asian moms, and nothing's ever good enough. Uh, you know, the students getting A's should go to the school and say, you are not teaching my child well enough, there's not challenging enough material here. You know, stuff like that. We're always wanting to say, hey, um, at least I'm talking about Asian culture, like, it's not good enough. Do better. But Christ needs to transcend our culture, right? Christ's word, Christ's example, is the model we have. And here, and when chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that never fades away. He rewards those who serve him and love him faithfully. So let's do that. Amen.